It's time for this week's wrestling perspective on Fightful.com. Professor Lars Fredrickson, I'm Dennis Farrell. What's going on, everybody? In just a few minutes, we have WWE Hall of Famer, 10-time tag team champion Stevie Ray joining us from Harlem Heat. I'm a little excited about this one, Lars. Yeah, me too. Uh, Harlem Heat, I always loved them. That was my brother Robert's favorite tag team of all time. As a matter of fact, when we went to Super Brawl, I think it was here. When it was in and at the it was an Oaken Coliseum. I think it was Oaken Coliseum. And Super Brawl was there. And I believe the main event was Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair. Uh, maybe that wasn't the main event. I don't remember. It could have been actually Kevin Nash and Rey Mysterio. But one of the reasons why my brother showed up and wanted to go is because he wanted to see his favorite tag team in the whole wide world, Harlem Heat. This is going to be a, a good interview, at least for us. But uh, I love the Harlem Heat. I, I, I love them. I always loved them. I thought they were great. I thought they looked the best. They looked so damn good. Didn't they? I, you know, when, and I was just saying this the other day when I was telling my buddy we were going to talk to Stevie Ray. Uh, if you look at Harlem Heat, I think they were one of the most underrated tag teams in WCW at that time. Easily. I would put them up there with the greats like Rock and Roll Express. I would put them up there with the Midnight Express. I'd put them up there with the uh, Mulkies. Just seeing if you're paying attention. I am. Well, I just said the Mulkies. I know. I know. I was like. I was just seeing dude. if you're paying. You, you, you got to fucking pop for that. Anyways, you know what, Dennis? I'm sick of your shit already. Let's get. Yes, some sir. Questions. Well, let's uh, let's hit some Q&A. We've cut them All short right. the last couple of weeks. And uh, today. We're going to empty out the emails as much as we possibly can. Cool. Jackson from Twitter, what was the last wrestling thing you've watched? Uh, I'll go first, and I, hopefully it's not the last thing you watched, but I stumbled upon this uh, Ron's Wrestling Federation. or It is the worst, greatest thing ever. And this guy named Ron oh. White, I don't – do you know who he is? Because if you, if you knew, Google yeah. him – he played, uh, and I'm not sure if he was or wasn't, but he played a a Nazi loving guy in Memphis wrestling in like the I want to say 70s, uh, it may be even the 60s. Uh, I I can send you some of these like uh, just weird. Uh, was he kind of like a Baron von Raschke kind of guy? Almost. He was like a Southern guy, but he carried a Nazi flag with him during some of his uh, promos. Wow. And, yeah. It wouldn't fly today. Uh, no. Because we were, me and my buddy Googled worst wrestling promos. You know, a couple of his popped up. And then we went down this rabbit hole where in the 80s and 90s in Memphis or Tennessee, he had his own wrestling promotion where the first part of the promotion, he just grabbed tapes that he had, play random matches from like nobody doing anything with his promotion. And then, you know, it'd be him and, uh, his partner talking about their wrestling school, and then it'd be a match from the wrestling school. It was the amazing Whoa. worst thing ever. Wow. So that's yeah. the last thing I've been watching. I Well, that was one of the last things I watched after you sent it over, and I said, ah, I can't watch that anymore. You know what I watched? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I watched some Polynesian Pacific Championship Wrestling was the last thing I watched on YouTube. I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole. I was trying to find the TV where yours truly at 13 years old, 12 years old, tries to get up on the ring and fight uh, one of the wrestlers. Did you it was on it? TV. No, can't find it. Oh, so I went down that rabbit hole. But I did see Lars Sanderson and some Kevin Sullivan shit. So that was cool. Miguel from Tusa, Tulsa. Uh, if you were in a zombie ap apocalypse with one wrestler, who would it be? CM Punk. Okay, I'd say Bray Wyatt because I feel like I could outrun him. Well, see, I say CM Punk because he's like one of my best friends, and I know that we would fucking get through it. I know we would win. I just have to be faster than Bray Wyatt. That's <laughs> it. I'm th I'm thinking of the slowest wrestler. Well, if you're Bray Wyatt, then you probably got a lot of Mountain Dew, which is going to keep you all set up. <laughs> and what bad decisions in his life did he make to get stuck with me during a zombie <laughs> apocalypse? That's the question I want to know. Right? Think about yeah, that. Yeah. Like that I'm true. next to him out of all the guys, it's me. Uh, funny. Alan from Hollywood, Florida. Name one overrated and one underrated wrestler from WWE and AEW. 
Each? I think so. Uh, Overrated? Here, why don't you go first? Because I got to think it. All right. I'm going to WWE for me, my underrated would be Austin Theory. This guy has really been growing on me. And I know he's only what, 20 something, maybe early 30s tops. That guy right there, I, I see future written all over him. His mic skills are amazing. He, he's great in the ring. He's got the look. I don't know why it. I'm guessing, you know, he was a Vince guy and Hunter came in and he kind of got buried down at the bottom again. But I don't know why he's not like main event in some pay-per-view right now. Yeah, I would say my underrated for that company would probably be the same. Honestly, when I think about it, like um, I, I'm pretty sure he's going to he's the future of that company. It's, it's just whatever needs to happen, that spark, that thing that happens with guys, you know. But you can see him being like the caliber of a rock or a Cena or somebody like that. I my, think my WWE overrated Charlotte Flair. Mm, mm. Uh, just not a Charlotte Flair guy. Is she to me in the ring? She just doesn't look like she has it. I mean, yeah. and maybe we're comparing her to her dad, and it's not fair. I don't know what it is, but when I watch her in the ring, I don't see the caliber of talent that everybody says I should be seeing. Well, see, this is where I disagree with you because as far as women's wrestling goes, if we're just going to categorize it, I think she's one of the best. I think I would say a Liv Morgan is more of the mo more overrated. I think she's terrible. Sorry, I don't know you, but I cannot watch it. It's just, I literally, I can't watch it. I just can't walk it, watch it. But I wouldn't say, uh, you know, in that class is all I'm saying. Right. But most overrated wrestler, I'm going to say Roman Reigns. <laughs> uh, I can hear people crashing their cars right now. Well, uh, at, least, at least the I, Roman Reigns lovers. I understand. Like, I understand. But it takes, it took a lot for him. And I, I'm talking extra, like the Usos, the Sami Zayn's, for me to get to pay attention to him. Honestly, that's just me personally. So I know I listen, this question is very subjective. And we both, I mean, you said Charlotte Fair, I'm saying Roman Reigns. We're talking probably about two of the all-time greats that will go down in the annals of history as the all-time greats. You know what I mean? And here I said Roman Reigns, you said Charlotte Fair. So. Yeah. But I can't argue with you on Roman. I don't like him, nor do I hate him. For me, he's just there. He's like and, fodder. Yeah. It, it, but unfortunately, when I look at the SmackDown roster, I'm not sure there's anybody else that I could legit buying being in his place, unfortunately. Well, well that's the – I feel like it's like the worst of two evils in a weird way, right? It's like yep. – it's kind of like, you know, some presidential elections that we've had. I agree. You, you know, in the history. Go ahead. So How about AEW? Uh, wow, that's a hard one because I feel like, you know, hmm. Do you I want me to go first? Yeah. Overrated? Uh, give me Hangman Page. Uh, I don't hate him, don't like him. I, I question why he's in the spot he is. I think in the future, he could be amazing. But right now, today, as we were recording this on 316 Steve Austin Day, mm. I don't I don't get him. I don't buy it. There's just, you know, uh, for me, if he was in a different company, he might be the guy you had to beat to go to an Intercontinental Championship. He, to me, he doesn't read main eventer for me. Yeah, he's definitely on that list for me too. Um, I would definitely say that he's not one of my favorites. Um, he, I would say John Moxley at this point. I can't I think, argue that one either. I think it's just the – I think there's just too much gratuity with him. There's nothing, you know – I feel like he's just, you know I, – I don't know. I just – I really, a couple of years ago, was his biggest fan, and I just – now I can't – I can't watch. The music doesn't fit him either. For, I don't I, hate the use of mainstream music in wrestling. I think it's an interesting uh, – bridge to gap to to till you can get a great music creative department but at least make it match and for me john that wild thing does not match john mox i know we're supposed to be buying that he's a unhinged guy but it's not a wild thing song for me 
Well, I see, that's where one thing I feel like with him makes sense in a weird way, you know? I mean, I get, you know, that it's like a, it's an homage to Onita, right? So, mm -hmm. and I think that that's probably one of his heroes. I mean, I've watched John Moxley's career, you know, throughout the decades and, I, you know, there was always, I always really liked him, but just these days, I just, I, I, uh, it's not that I don't dislike him. You know, I just think it's just like, it's too much. And I think, I think the dispension of disbelief literally goes out the window when he wrestles. And by the way, people out there, we can easily flip on these guys any second. Something Straight can up. change. Uh, and we're not saying we don't like them. We're just saying the spot they're in or what they're doing today. And Because I think a lot of people think when we say on this podcast, we don't like this guy or we don't get this guy, it's forever. It's not. My opinion no. changes just like that. I'll tell you what. And the classic example for me was one week I wasn't feeling Braun Strowman. And then the next week I was feeling Braun Strowman. So – it's like, and that was a, obviously, a, you know, some years ago, but my point is, it's like, that's how quick, like you said, to make an example, because we're not here to be, we're not, we're not pundits. We're just wrestling fans. And this week it's Roman Reigns, Charlotte Flair. Now John Moxley underrated. By the, by the way, in that lead, the, I'm going to say this because I was talking to a buddy and we were talking about, the, we were talking about WCW and, uh, he was talking about how bad WCW was when we were growing up. And I was like, dude, at 10 years old, we don't know what good and bad wrestling is. I, I couldn't tell you what was over or was not. I liked what I liked. I mean, and I think people like to go back with their revisionist history of what they know now and all the podcasts. And then they like to say, well, uh, WCW was really bad. It wasn't for me. I loved it, but I didn't know what was good or bad. Did you at a young age? Yes, but. I think that I had also been watching wrestling since I was 10. And by the time that those two companies were going off, I had, you know, how many years of watching wrestling? So I feel like I had a good comprehension of what, what was trying to be portrayed on screen. Now, I wouldn't say WCW was all bad. I no. wouldn't say WCW was all good. I wouldn't say either about WWF or WWE, whatever you want to fucking call it this week. Because... It just is what it is. But I feel like there were certain things I didn't like. Like, I don't like Ernest the Cat Miller. <laughs> Who's you know our I mean? guest next week? Oh, way to go. But you know what I'm saying? Yes. Like, I didn't really 100% get Hooventude at the time. Now I do. Now I love watching him do his shit. I love it. I can't <laughs> help it. You know? This does go into our next qu question. Well, for we me. haven't picked our underrated for AEW. Oh, that's good. Thank you for saving me on that one then. Sure. Um, my underrated for AEW, you know what? I'm going to go on a limb here, and I don't think he gets the respect, and I'm not saying he deserves to be at a higher Can I read level. your mind? Yes. I'm going to say it's – I can't guest. Go ahead. QT Marshall. Mm. Hear me out now before okay. you shake your head. Mm. Uh this guy, I not so much in the ring, but as a manager right now, uh, I don't think he gets the proper respect he does as being a heel manager. Uh, I, I like what he's doing. Uh, I'm not saying, and by the way, when I say underrated, I don't mean he needs to be slingshotted to the top. I just am saying in this aspect, I don't think he gets the the recognition he deserves for what he's doing right now. Yeah, I don't need to see any more QT Marshall in my life. Um, uh, my Who's next week's guest, too. Yeah, they're both going to be here, and Hooventude is going to be here, too. Um, underrated, I'm going to say MJF, and I'll tell you why because everybody thinks MJF can't, can't wrestle. And when after that Iron Man match, even though there wasn't like you know, honestly, that match would have meant so much more if it wasn't all the stupid shittery that was beforehand, but at the end of the day. That was one of the best, finest wrestling matches I've seen in a very, very long time. And I do not think that he gets the credit. I think where he gets credit is by being a talker. Where he gets put over is by because he's a good communicator. But motherfucker can wrestle. Just there saying. I, I, you're, you're on with that one. That's a good one, actually. And I would never have thought about putting him there. But that, damn it. 
that's a good one. Um, Thomas from New York wants to know what is your round Mount Rushmore top four WCW wrestlers? You go first because that was your shit. It was. Um, I feel like I have to put Sting on that list. Mm, for sure. Um, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to put Ric Flair, although I don't like Ric Flair. Uh, my other two, man. Can I if I pick a tag team, will it count as two or one? I think it sounds counts as two. That's going to be a tough one then. Uh, All right, then let's count it as one. uh, Okay. Uh, Legion of Doom, Road Warriors. Well, but were they really WCW though? Come on. Well, that's how I knew them. I mean. Whatever, dude. Whatever. (laughs) I think you could do better. I think you could do better. Because the Road Warriors were literally in every, you know, company. All right. All right. Um, I'm not going to pander to the Harlem Heat fans and put them on there just because he's coming on uh, Stevie Ray. I, 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 I am. Okay. Uh gosh, the other two, you know what? You know what you go as I think. If you have two, maybe we'll go two and two to give us time to think. There is four, right? Right. One tag team, three individuals that I think what when I think WCW, I think Ray Mysterio Jr. for whatever reason. I think Sting, I think Flair, and I think Harlem Heat. Hmm. That's a good one. Damn it. You know what? Give me Goldberg. I put Goldberg on that list because of the streak. Yeah, and... but was it? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's arguable. I yeah. Think I think you're failing, Dennis. I am. I am. I, 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 I'm struggling and I loved it. Uh, Maybe the Zodiac? <laughs> the Shocker? I'm going to. Shockmaster, bro. The Shockmaster. The, sorry, I was thinking the wrong Shocker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that just happened. Uh, you know what? I, since I've pissed you off already, I'm going Lex Luger as number four. Okay, that's fair. That's yeah. fair. So I, I'll give it to Lex. I'll give it to Lex. I, gr- granted, not the best in the ring, but you know what? He, he when you he think had, he had the thing, he had the thing. I no, I'm with you. I, I like you know, I, I couldn't argue that. I could not argue against that. I mean, Lex Luger was a was a fixture in that company. Uh, we did have a stables question. I guess since we have a couple seconds, right. uh, we're gonna. I'll ask this. This comes from uh, Josh from San Jose. In the past, I've heard you guys talk about stables and groups, but can you guys tell me one of your favorite stables or groups and why you like them? Freebirds. I love yeah. the Freebirds because it was like a band. I mean, hell, they even made records, right? So. But I looked at them and I felt like it was a band. I mean, of course, everybody thinks the Four Horsemen, obviously, that's the one that you will always go to. But the Freebirds, man, there was something wild and unhinged that they brought. I mean, the 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 Four Horsemen were more of like the Republican Party, whereas the Freebirds were like the fucking crazy fucking anarchists. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, because I when I think of the Horsemen, I think of the suits and ties, right? And that kind of like, you know, corporate America kind of thing and that, i think that's what they were kind of trying to portray and i think that's why it worked with dusty Rhodes and magnum ta because they're more salt of the earth kind of like farmer son of a plumber you know that kind of thing but the free birds for me were the wildest anarchistic fucking maltov cocktail motherfuckers i loved them i agree uh 100 for me it was a free birds because anytime they came on tv it made whatever product they were on that much better and it made it feel like it was a next level show when ps michael hayes came out in those robes and the dancing around i i didn't think i was watching a show that just couldn't afford lighting around i thought i was watching something so much better because he brought that much more talent to him so bad street atlanta ga bad street in the whole usa and with that we are bringing stevie ray back on here on in two seconds wrestling perspective you want your question answered wrestling perspective at gmail.com lars are you ready to get a little bit uh hall of fame-ish i'm fucking ready to get on fire baby Lars, here we are, Wrestling Perspective, 10-time tag team champ, WWE Hall of Famer, one half of Harlem Heat. I grew up watching them. You watched them because you were a little bit older than me. It's Stevie Ray. Stevie, thank you so much for taking a few minutes out of your time to hang out with us tonight. No problem, guys. So, listen, I'm a massive fan of yours and Vince Russo's. 
And I'm just going to open this up with a Vince Russo question because I like him. When I was doing fantasy baseball, Vince Uh Russo was one of the guys who stood up and helped me out and might have been my first guest talking fantasy baseball. But when you, I would love to have heard that. It was not good on my part. That was Uh, Vince. Vince Vince is a big baseball fan, but he don't know nothing about baseball. (laughs) I have to school him on baseball. Oh, I love it. I have to school him. But you know, I've always wondered, as, as a guy what? who works with him, I think a lot of times in the uh, internet world we live in, he gets a raw deal. People want to blast everything he's done or everything mm-hmm. he has did, but mm-hmm. not give him the respect for what he does. Is there anything – and trust me, I'm a fan. I know – I I only know – Oh, brother, I understand. You don't have to be apologetic about it. But, but – Yeah. The thing about – the go ahead. I was going to say, how do we help people understand that, you know, Vince Russo, whether you like him or not, should have the respect he deserves? Well, Vince, to be honest with you, I've had him on my show, regrettably. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we do a show together. I'm not going to say regrettably, but I don't know what word I should use. I'll, I'll reuse that one. Unfortunately, you so, do a so, show with them. You know, you know, the vernacular kind of ran out. But then, anyway, uh, I'll find something in here in a minute. I'll find a word in a minute. Uh, but with all due respect, Vince and I have talked about exactly what you are referring to right now on many occasions. And I myself had to let him know why he gets the vitriol that he gets from the fans and not only from the fans from the boys also okay now i'm one of the boys i should know this but the thing is this when you put in a position like vince was a lot of things that you're trying to do people don't understand because they're coming from a whole different genre of professional wrestling than the way you look at it. So in essence, they don't understand. So when somebody doesn't understand things, a lot of times they rebel. And then when the chatter gets out there to the fans, because you got to realize we didn't have, uh, you know, some of the social media outlets that we have now back then. So when you hear the chatter between the guys, and guys talking to other outlets, it filters into the fans' heads, if you understand what I'm saying. So when something is repetitiously regurgitated over and over and over again, what do you have? That is the misunderstanding of Vince Russo. So let me give you an example. If I'm doing something with a Scott Steiner, when Vince comes, Vince and Ed Farrar comes into WCW and they're trying to rewrite things. Well, they're coming from New York. They're coming from Vince. So they don't look at this thing like some of the guys do that have been doing this for the last 10, 12 years. They don't look at it like that. They look at it on a totally different uh, entertainment base of professional wrestling. So a lot of the guys don't get it. Because this mindset is coming from another place. It's just like a coach coming into a football team. And he wants to have a run-oriented offense and a very tough defense. Well, a lot of the modern-day players will look at that like it's yesterday. We passed the ball. Why isn't he doing that? If you see what I'm saying. Or vice versa. So when Vince was coming in, I knew him and Ed was going to have a rough time because, man, uh, trying to change a perspective of a person's inner mind is hard to do because they don't know nothing else. If you feed a dog table scraps all his life and then next day you go buy some Purina dog food, he ain't going to eat it, brother. He's only going to eat it when he's forced to because he doesn't have anything else. So you can be misunderstood that way. And Vince didn't know that the mindset of professional wrestling in WCW was like that. So that's where the vitriol comes from. I hope I explain explain that to you guys to understand it. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Um, 
you never made the jump over to the WWF no. WWE. No. Um, was that a conscious thing? Do you think I, I, think I didn't want first of all, first of all, I had a my daughter was like seven at the time, and I wanted to be home more. Uh that's firstly. Secondly, I didn't, I'm not into doing uh stereotypical characters. I'm not into that. And I know that's exactly, that's the history of WWE. And I don't want any part of it. So that was basically my whole decision on the whole thing. I, I want to go back because we've all done radio and mm -hmm. we were talking a little bit about kind of what we've done in the past. You mm -hmm. do a podcast. Uh, I when I watch you a lot of times on Facebook when you do your half of the podcast. So I kind of mm -hmm. get half the conversation. I really do enjoy it. Mm -hmm. What I guess I'm trying to ask this question is you have an amazing mind for the business. And even the other night you were talking about how, you know, people just look at you and think you are a dumb black guy. And obviously you're not. Yeah, that's the stereotypical thing that ha that's America. Right. Yeah. That's no ever... disrespect to nobody, but that's what when you have been, you know, when you go through the school system here in the United States, you're trained. Um, you're not trained to you're not taught on how to think. Right. Uh, but... You know, you're taught on what to think. So when you memorize. got stereo when you got stereotypical things that's you know running through pop culture channels on a daily basis, whether it be pro wrestling, this, that, and the other, pro uh, pro football players, basketball players, this, that, and the other. It is what it is. So that's what I'm talking about. Not throwing mud or slinging fingers. I'm just talking about the world of which I live in. But I know a lot of people don't get that because they're not trained to get that mentally. Well, as far as your mind in the creative aspect in pro wrestling, Mm -hmm. I, I often find out when wrestlers, when we talk to them, who trained them in the ring and who mm -hmm. helped them creatively outside are two different people. Right. Who was the guy that helped, I guess, you creatively in wrestling? And even now, when you break down, it, it, your mind is genius. Why don't you have a job? Because I, I sit back and think Steve Ray's a guy that should be, you know, <laughs> writing or helping come up with some storylines somewhere. I mean, like an MLW could absolutely use someone like you. You know, I really appreciate that. But the thing is, uh, I don't think I could be around professional wrestling the way I used to be around it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I just don't have that vigor to be around it like that. I just, I, I've written a documentary uh, that I'm trying to get. Uh, I, I wish I could tell you more about it. I probably can off the camera, but I can't on the camera. And that's the kind of stuff that makes me excited. And I'm also in the midst of right now of uh, negotiate, putting a book together. Those are the kind of things that gets me excited. But being around the wrestling business, man, people just don't know, brother. It's not, I'm just not built for it anymore, bro. I'm just not. Mentally, I'm not built for it. It's just... That rat race can get to you, brother. And that's why you see so many guys right now. And you know this, guys, from, from my ilk and my era and stuff like that, man. You know, brother, this business has warmed down, man, to beat them up. It has. And it's it's a tough business. It's a tough business. And if you don't have some kind of, you know, something to lean on spiritually, mentally, and stuff like that, it'll eat you alive. And that's why I'd rather do my own thing, man. It might have something to do with wrestling, but I'd rather do my own thing. Matter of fact, I was talking to AEW about a couple of things also that's still in the works right now too. But it's not something that's got me on the road of being out there or something like that. That's pretty much all I can say about that. Well, you know, you have an a copious amount of professional wrestling that, we as fans can consume. There's so much out there. You got Impact, you got AEW, right. WWE, MLW, right. NWA. Right. You got the Japanese, you know, uh, market has now made its right. presence here in the United States. How do you sift through it as far as, because obviously this part of your, what you're doing, it's like you probably have to watch some or if not all to kind Actually, of get. 
Actually, I don't. You don't watch any? A little. Well, here what are you there. watching? What are you here, watching? Here, here and there. You know, I might catch SmackDown for an hour. You know what I'm saying? I mean, up 30 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever. I might catch AEW. I like AEW. I like, I really, it, they really, uh, that's a really interesting show. Very interesting show. And uh, I find myself watching the shows and I do commentary. So I have to stop watching it. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I can't watch it like a fan. I'm either watching it like in a critique type fashion, or I'm like, if I was doing the commentary, this is what I would have said. So it's like, it, it mentally is drawing me back into it, you know? And it's like, I, I tried to just watch the show and I went through all this. So I'm, you know, it's kind of crazy. Well, what is it about the AEW programming that you're finding that's resonating with you and connecting? Oh, with it's you? just different. It's just different. Anything different than the norm, I like. You know, and I think they're doing a, I think they're doing a good job, man. I think they're getting there. If you look at the product from when they started as to where they are right now, you know, slowly but surely, they're getting there. And that's what I like. I like to see the progress of those young men doing their things, even the storyline, so on and so forth. And even the girls, you know, the, the girl, the girls are getting there. I think if you look at uh, the WWE product, the women's side is very, very advanced. Very, very advanced. I really like watching them. They give a hell of a show, you know, from a professional wrestling, you know, perspective. Now, the girls on AEW, you know, they're getting there, but they're still a little convoluted as to where they're putting everything together and just don't have that cohesiveness yet. But I think slowly but surely, Going back a couple of years ago, as to right now, you can see the progress. I kind of want to go back to the mental health aspect that you brought up a few minutes ago. Uh, mm -hmm. and you kind of realized you were not built for it in the rat race. Was there mm -hmm. a, a moment maybe during your career or even after where it kind of clicked with you? Like, you know what? Uh, I can sit back and watch on TV, but I do not uh, want to pursue it as a wrestler in ring or backstage. Hmm. Nah, that's just something I know. There's just something I feel. I don't think it was no certain moment or anything like that. It's just the fact that I got so many different interests and so many other things that I just feel as though some people in the wrestling business miss out on so much because they're so enthronged with professional wrestling. I never want to be one of those people. You know, I don't want to call names, but you, I don't want to be, a, you know, you got guys out there that used to be, you know, in the big time. Now they're chasing every independent show and chasing every autograph signing and stuff like that, you know, just to make ends meet. Brother, I'm bigger than that, bro. I've been a hustler all my life, man. I'm straight off the corner, bro. I had my own business before I got in the wrestling business. Ain't no punk in me, bro. And I ain't scared to be poor even though I'm not, but I'm just saying, I'm just cut from a different cloth. I know where I come from. I'm proud of where I come from. I know my people. I'm proud of my people. I go out and do public speaking, things of that nature. I go out and do appearances every now and then. I'm into so many different things, whereas I'm trying to uplift people. That's what I like. You know, it's bigger than chasing a dollar, chasing a dream. I already accomplished my dream. I already accomplished it. So I'm at peace because I'm doing what I want to do. If that makes any sense to anybody. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Do you feel like now with so many companies and so many places for, for guys and gals to work, do you think that sort of, you know, fosters more of that creative freedom that we're now? Because we have a lot of guests on here. Yeah. Both both past and, and, and present. And yeah. a lot of the things that are being said, like a lot of the older guys say, well, the, the, the creative freedom is more important than the than the financial, but the financial is nice, obviously. But then mm -hmm. you get some opinions that are like, I'm just there to work. You tell me what to fucking do and I'm going to do it. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so do you think that this environment fosters that creative control that are not creative control, excuse me, creative freedom for the for the performer to have? I think it all depends on the company and who's running things. You know, 
I think a lot of times, um, you know, in some companies, it's my way or the highway. And then some companies give you a little bit more freedom, you know. So I think it's a double-edged sword. It all depends on the uh, individual. It all depends on the individual as to how, you know, having creative freedom is one thing. It's another thing having the, you know, outlook uh, as a professional wrestler to give, you know, an assessment as to how things should be. A lot of people are not qualified to do that. So it all depends on the individual. Because some of these guys have been working the outlaw shows so much, they don't really get the big time TV mentality. No knock on nobody. I'm just saying from a talent point of view, I mean, all of that's important. All of it's important. It's just like uh, we were talking about Vince Russo. I went to Vince and I wrote out the whole thing back in the angle that me and my brother did. A lot of people don't know that. I wrote the whole angle and gave it to him and he loved it and he let us do it. That's because I've studied professional wrestling my whole life. And not only that, I'm a big movie buff and a TV buff, you know, back in the day. So I just took all of that stuff and said, hey, this would be good if we do this, that, and the other. And I remember so many of the angles from the past in professional wrestling. So all of that stuff is, you know, like laying in my head, just swimming around. And I didn't even know I was very good at that. Because it was there. You know, speaking kind of on this, last week we had the Impact Tag Team Champions, Chris Bay and Ace Who? Austin on. Chris Bay and Ace oh, Austin. Oh, okay. And, and, and Impact, yeah. Yes. And we were talking to them about how nowadays these younger guys are getting on TV with eight, seven, six matches under their belt where, you know, when, when you were in there, if you're not in the industry for 10 years, you're not seeing <laughs> even a dark match and your guy that, uh, Oh no, you got to get through that process. You're 100% right. It, you're a guy with a wrestling school. How now do you prepare this next generation of wrestling talent to not look like fools or even embarrass what you're doing out there where you do see a lot of that quality control gone in the industry. Well, and like I said, it all depends on who's running running things and who, what company it is, so on and so forth. And if you think guys are ready for certain levels of wrestling, whether it be Impact, whether it be AEW, stuff like that, and they're not, to be honest, it's not a knock on the guys. It's a knock on the guys that put them out there. Because you still have to think about your product. You still have to think about your product. Now, there's a lot of guys professed to be wrestlers or great wrestlers. And maybe they are at a lower level. It's levels to everything if that makes sense. If you're a high school quarterback, that's one thing. If you're a college quarterback, that's another. If you're a professional Super Bowl quarterback, that's another. They're all quarterbacks, but they all perform on different levels. And it's up to the people that run things, that run in the product and put it out there to recognize that. So if you put a quarterback from high school in a professional football game, and he looks like garbage. Who fault is that? Damn. That, I haven't <laughs> thought about it like that, Lars. <laughs> well, that's why we brought Stevie Ray on to score. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that I, you know, because Harlem Heat, obviously one of my favorite tag teams, also one of Dennis's. And I was telling him a story about my older brother, you know, who's no longer with us here. No, but I'm sorry to hear that. Part of the, oh, no, it's okay. It happened 20 years ago. But we... One of the reasons why we went to go, he wanted to come was to see the Harlem Heat because that was his tag team, right? Because something resonated. Because something about you guys oozed where we came from too because we came from, you know, low-income housing, that mm -hmm. kind of situation, you know? And uh, you guys had so much chemistry between the two of you. And, but the, the most important part, and this is the part I'm trying to get to, is the chemistry that you had with others. Right now, it seemed pretty instantaneous. Was there mm -hmm. ones opponents that you really had to work at getting that sort of fluidity with? Well, it because all depends. It all depends on how long you work together. A lot of the I understand exactly what you're talking about, and that's a very good question because 
m most people try to get to that question, but they don't know how. So what you just asked was totally the right way to ask it. And I appreciate that. Um, it all depends on how much you've worked with them. Our thing was we were trained by Scott Casey um, back in the day. And Scott Casey used to put drill in our heads about how a lot of a lot of times me and my brother felt like we were the quarterbacks or the uh point guards of the match. That's how we felt. It's our job to make you and Lars look good. That's our job. Going into the match, that's my and my brother's job to make you guys look good. So don't worry about it. Whatever we do, don't worry about it. At the end of the day, you're going to look better than you ever looked. And that was our job. And we took pride in that because that's the way we were trained. It's easy to, don't worry about it. I'm going to get my stuff in, this, that, and the other. But this match is going to look good. And I want you guys to look strong because me and my brother knew we were a strong tag team, you know, because that was a persona that we gave out. But we need the other tag team to look just as strong. Mm -hmm. So mentally, that's the show. Like in the movie Staying Alive, when the guy told John Travolta, it's about the show, Monero, not you. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah, in the movie Staying Alive. Yeah. I, first of all, first of all, you referencing Staying Alive is one thing because that's right. some that's a deep motherfucking cut, my man. <laughs> 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 but that was our mentality. It's not about Harlem Heat. Right. It's not about the guys that are across the ring from us. It's about the show. If we look good and you look good, the show looks good. Right. Right. We never had a selfish mentality because that was not the way we were trained. And we know people that do and this, that, and the other, but ain't about that because we're over and we know we're over. We're unique and we know we're unique. So why push the envelope and try to uh, take liberties up on people's liberties just because you can? That's not a good work ethic, and that's not fair to the show and the people that's paying you your salary. You know, we're talking a little bit about your past. You were a WWE Hall of Famer, and as a sports guy, mm -hmm. I – I think the WWE misses a great opportunity with their Hall of Fame like the NFL does, where they make it a big show of the people being told they were going to going in. Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. For for you, I, I, I guess we've had the Hall of Famers on and we've never asked this question, but what was the process for you finding out or being asked if you wanted to be inducted into the Hall of Fame? No, oh, just a phone call. All right. Thanks. <laughs> it was a phone call. A phone was call it, on a, a day, huh? Was it a special moment for you, or was it just like it was sure, a phone call on a day where I was having a bad day? <laughs> it's one of those days. I'm having a bad day, and I am really was something that had to do with my business at the time. I had a trucking company back then, and I don't know. I don't know if I was dealing with one of my clients. I can't remember or something. Uh, one of my drivers. I don't remember now. But I'm just getting up. I'm just pissed off that day about something. And I knew my Legends contract was coming up for renewal. You know, and I didn't know if they were going to renew it or not. And my phone rings. I look at my phone. I'm not going to call his name, but WWE. And I'm like, thinking to myself, now I'm just putting this... I'm just putting this stuff in my mind. Why? Because I'm I'm pissed off already. I need somebody to get mad at right now. Better him than anybody else right now. Because I'm thinking he's <laughs> calling me. I'm thinking he's calling me to uh, say, hey, Stevie Ray, we're not going to renew your, your Legends contract. You know, not that I, you know, at the time, I didn't care anyway. So I'm like, hello. And the guy goes, hey, Stevie Ray? Yeah, man, what do you want? Are you okay? Dog, I'm okay. What do you want, bro? <laughs> Man, I just called to tell you that 
you guys are getting inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. <laughs> now I feel like a, the proverbial heel. Yeah. I'm talking about a real heel, man. I'm talking about the old 1950s cartoon heel, mm. you know, and I couldn't say nothing because now you cross between two emotions. My anger emotion and somebody just telling you, you just achieved the ultimate goal in professional wrestling. So I couldn't say nothing. I was like, and he was like, hello? Stevie, are you still there? I go, yeah. He said, man, I just want to call and let you know that we talked, we called Booker already. Maybe you should call him and y'all talk about it. But uh, that's all I want to say. And he hung up. And that was when you asked me that question about how, how did it feel? I still remember that day like it was yesterday, bro. I still remember that day. It, it was, it was crazy. So that was my emotions at that time. That's what happened. So, because I, I hadn't even been thinking about stuff like, you know what I'm saying? That's not on my mind at all, at all. And it happens. So, you know, it is what it is, bro. Well, okay. So I'm going to go a little far east here. Okay. And ask this question and see if I was on point with something. Okay. okay. Because you said something that made me think of this question. Okay. And it's the way I always felt about the Harlem Heat. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong or tell me I'm way outside the ballpark. When I was a kid, during the summertime, they had the dollar flicks, right? You go to this what? one, the dollar flicks, we call okay. it. Okay. Paid one dollar and you got three movies and your mom gave you two fifty and the whole day you got a hot dog, you got a Coke, you got a popcorn, and you'd sit down and you'd watch three movies for a buck. I remember, I, I re I remember the days, but yeah, okay. go ahead. So we're probably roughly around the same age. So <laughs> I always thought, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember one of the things that I always loved was when I had a triple feature of some Shaw Brothers Kung Fu <laughs> action. Okay. Right. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I always had that same feeling when you guys would be in the ring. I always felt it was like, a kung fu movie, not necessarily <laughs> in the, not necessarily in the moves, well, but in the saying. psych, in the psychology of it. It wasn't. It was just as dumb, done, dumbed down for the layman to understand. But yet there was a higher thing there right. on the on the top, and right. and and if you could clue in, that's where that that real suspension of disbelief was. Right. And I felt that when I would watch you guys. Because it wasn't choreographed, but it was more of a, a of like a fluid movement, like a, you know, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. So now, am I completely off base to say that watching a Harlem Heat match, it was it, some, somewhat uh, um, inspired by kung fu theater? <laughs> me and my brother are the two biggest Shaw brother fans. Ah, god damn it! Knew it! Yeah. I knew it! I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Me and my brother, nobody's ever, nobody. This is a first, ladies and gentlemen, who's ever watching this show. This is a first. This is a first. Me and my brother are the two biggest Shaw Brothers fans in the history of television movies. Yeah. I took my brother when he was little. How old was he then? My brother might have been. Oh God. Eight, nine years old. And I took him to see his first Kung Fu movie. We went downtown, kind of like what you were talking about. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we rode the bus. It was the first time he had ridden the bus downtown. And uh, we watched movie. And the movie that I took him to watch was I think it was Five Fingers of Death. I think it was either, I think, yeah, I think it was Five Fingers of Death. Or five, was uh, it Five Deadly Venoms or Five Fingers of Death? I think it was five, I don't think it was, 
Now I'm crossing myself. Yeah, off. no, I get it. It might have been both of them playing. <laughs> Fair enough. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It might have been both of them playing. And uh it was like you said, a triple feature. And one of the other movies was the Chinese Hercules. <laughs> okay. With with Bolo, with Bolo. Yeah, it was the first time we had ever seen Bolo. Way before the end of the dragon stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um and uh well no, it was after the end of the dragon stuff, but uh I but anyway, but yeah, but uh, yeah, I still remember that day that I took my little brother to downtown Houston, Texas to watch Kung, uh, Kung Fu Theater, whatever it was. And oh, brother, I still remember that. Golly. And I haven't even thought about that <laughs> day until you just brought that up. <laughs> so we were the biggest Shaw brother. Oh, my God, man. And one of my cousins also, one of my cousins. So my brother and my cousin used to be Im imitating and emulating their moves. You know what I'm saying? On from the movie. Oh my God, this is crazy, man. Nobody's ever said that to me before. Well, it's just the way that you guys would carry yourself. I swear to God, I would be <laughs> transformed and I would be like, I'm watching a Shaw Brothers flick right now. <laughs> just, it was the mannerisms, it was the movements. Right. I mean, as you can tell, I, I love professional wrestling. That's right. my that's my thing, right? So right. I'm just glad I was on to something. I'm just yeah. And, okay. I've never nobody's ever said that to me before. This is the first. <laughs> All right, cool. This is the first. Crazy. Is it, is it safe to say we're now your favorite podcast? <laughs> oh, that's crazy, man. It's crazy. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy. Well, I, I know we're getting to the end of this interview, and my last question, I want to talk about your podcasting because you talk to a lot of guys. And in wrestling, podcasting is a dirty word. And mm -hmm. I don't like that feeling because I feel like in a lot of ways, podcasting has helped, you know, keep the industry and bring it back. And it I doesn't agree. get the respect I, it I deserves. Agree. So when someone comes to you and says, Stevie Ray, would you do a podcast? Did you have to be talked into it? Was it something that you were like? No, it all depends. Go? It all depends. I used to do some. I, I stopped doing them. Because like, you know, some 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 of these guys just don't know what they're doing and don't know what they're talking about. I mean, they're wrestling fans and they're trying to trying to get out there. But I take what I do very seriously. I take what I do very seriously. Cause like I said, I was working in radio before I started podcasting. And uh and, and people don't realize that's what I had, you know, a desire to do when I got out of high school. I want to be into radio, stuff that I, you know, that was one of my goals. And I used to DJ in clubs and stuff like that. And you know, so that was love. But then you, as you start to do other things, you start to have other interests and stuff like that. Then I dropped out of school anyway. So uh, dropped out of college, my first year of college anyway. So never, you know, you plan to go back this, that, and the other. I never thought it would all come back around, you know, 25 years later or, or more, you know, uh, 30 years later, rather. And, and I would be doing something that I enjoyed doing as a kid as a teenager, you know, so it was, uh, it's been really refreshing. So it's like, okay, it's funny how things work. I never thought my younger man life would come back around as an older guy, you know, and one of my brothers called me. I used to go do sports radio on one of the radio stations here. And I would get into these big debates on the radio and the people would be calling in and you know, and I turn into Stevie Ray on them on the radio, you know, with the with the with the sports guy, you know, the sports guy. And he would always call me, hey Stevie, can you come down to the station and uh talk about a few things? And I'm like, yeah. So as we did this for about a year, it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and people started calling into the show asking, when is Stevie Ray gonna come back on? So I would come back in and he bring up a subject. Well, what do you think about so-and-so? And I would go heal, you know, <laughs> I'm an entertainer. You know what I'm saying? You know, instead of, you know, I, I would use a little sports influence cause I'm a real big sports guy, but I would turn into a heel at the same time. And the people loved it. So when people call into the show, uh, well, Ralph, that's the guy named Ralph. Well, Ralph, I think Stevie Ray doesn't know what he's talking about. This, that, and you know, and I, hey, hey, look, sucker, I don't know who you are, you know what I'm saying, but you better have a little bit more respect for Stevie Ray. 
other than that, you wouldn't be calling into the show. You're just pissed off because I told you what was really up and Ralph can't tell you because he's under salary. Well, I don't work for nobody, sucker. You know, what we had go. So I go into that, you know what I'm saying? And the people, then the phone lines just go crazy. Because here come the next guy to challenge yeah. me, you know? And they didn't really know that I knew sports. They didn't know, oh, this guy really knows sports. You know, I'm not just some Johnny come lately. And I would tell, you know, look, brother, I don't need a computer. I don't have to look at the computer. I already know what's what, you know? And so it became a stick thing, him against me, you know? And the owner loved it so much. The owner of the station loved it so much. He gave me my own radio show. That's awesome. Well, yeah. Pro, ra pro wrestling on radio. <laughs> well, it's, it makes perfect sense. I mean, honestly. <laughs> um, okay. So my last question. What's that? You, uh, Harlem Heat had a bunch of managers. The only one that, that I feel like maybe didn't make the most sense is Colonel Tom Parker, please let me. Actually, me Colonel, answers. the Colonel was never our. Mer Colonel was never. I thought our he man. was. No, I thought he was. I, no, he was doing an angle with Sherry. Him and Sherry was having a thing. So, by the fact that she was in having a a, a, a relationship with him, he came out. That's with us. what it was. That's yeah. what it was. Okay, so yeah, but the, okay, then 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 I don't have a last question. I thought I yeah. thought the same thing. Because I, as a WCW guy, I watch. I'm like, why is Colonel Tom coming out with Harlem Heat? And it never. <laughs> I think Lars was on to the same thing I was thinking was why why is this guy coming out with you guys? So because never... of, because of Sherry. Remember him and Sherry. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I remember that. A, they were having an affair, and slowly right. but surely we started getting angry at him right. because we started losing. Man, it was all a ploy to get his guys over. But Sherry couldn't see through it. If right, 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 right. You know okay. So. Okay, well, let me ask we you. Had fun. Me... We had fun with that, though. All right, well, then let me rephrase that question. Of all okay. the managers that you've had, who do you think? I Because now. We only we... had, we only, as far as I'm concerned, before you even continue with that, with all due respect, we only had one manager, Sherry. Everything else is bullshit. Everything else didn't work, and it was bullshit. So. Whatever else is in your mind, take it and throw it away. Okay. Sherry was the only person that worked with us, and that was by choice. That was by our choice. Everything else was, uh, uh, I've been on record of saying, you know, when they let Sherry go, I didn't even want to do Harlem Heat anymore. The way they treated her. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do it anymore. And then they put Jackie with us. I love Jackie to death. She's like a little sister to me, you know, but... That's not what we wanted. That's what they wanted. And we were like, this ain't working for us. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. by the mere fact that you don't have the uh, professionalism to let us know that Sherry's not going to be with us anymore shows you what you think of us in a roundabout way. Mm -hmm. So I had a fucking problem with that. A hell of a problem with it. To put somebody in, I don't know what she got going with whoever you know, to keep somebody on the payroll or whatever. You know what I'm saying? I, I ain't down with that kind of bullshit, bro. That ain't me. I'm not a go along to get along type guy. And if you don't think my opinion is, is viable, then you're telling me, fuck you. And I say the same thing to you. Fuck you. Mm -hmm. So it is what it is. Fair enough. If people want more of your opinion, which I certainly do, where can people find you? Oh, the real Stevie Ray or Stevie Ray athlete on uh, Facebook, real Stevie Ray on Instagram and Twitter. And you can watch my show straight shooting with Stevie Ray. There it is right behind me. The world's most dangerous podcast. Cause I don't pull any punches. You want to talk about it. We can talk about it regardless what it may be. Or you go to Twitch, go to Stevie Ray TV on YouTube, go to where Stevie Ray TV on Twitch and brother it's on like a steaming pot of neck bones. And that's how it goes. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you so much for being part of my childhood. You don't know it, but you were there in my childhood. As I, fully, I appreciate that. Yeah, I didn't even know what WWE was. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, Morrow. Oh, so, okay. So, you know, Clayton Where County. Where are you now? Uh, I'm in Michigan. Damn. 
Yeah, it. I got lost. <laughs> I went went out for milk and cigarettes and never came back. Yeah, yeah. Golly, man. <laughs> Took a left turn at Albuquerque. Yeah, man, it, 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 it got lost. Man, <laughs> yeah. it got lost. But, what you do, running a lake or something? Well, we don't ask those questions uh, around this part of town, you know. Snitches get snitches. That's what we I, say. I, I, I like the, I, I like the, the governor that got kidnapped. <laughs> oh yeah, that's Remember that's that? what I like. That's and some Mich- that's some straight Michigan shit, right yeah, there, man. Bro. The dudes, I'm like what. We should get kidnapped by the, the, the three stooges. And if the government's watching, I had nothing to do with it. So I'm perfectly innocent, by the way. Oh, my goodness, brother. That really entertained me, man. I mean, this is apparently they didn't watch any episodes of 24. <laughs> if I'm involved, it's three. Jack Bible could have helped them. <laughs> they was watching Mayberry RFD. <laughs> Oh, not the original, uh, not the original one, the one with Ken Berry. Stevie, Stevie, man, I want to hang out with you, bro. I mean, it sounds like we would have a lot of fun. I mean, this oh, has brother. been, this has been, this has been great. And, and and to to reiterate what Dennis said, thank you so much for for entertaining me and be, be, being one of my favorite of all time tag teams. Hey, I appreciate it, man. Thank I you lo- very much. I, I always loved you guys, and I always will. So, and here I have an opportunity to say, Stevie, <laughs> I love you. No problem, man. I appreciate it, man. Thank you.